So next we have our first panel of the day, um, and I have the treat of introducing the moderator, Colonel Paul B. Olson, Army, retired. He is the Director of Programs and Partnerships for Old Dominion University's Office of Research, where he enables research projects between the university and federal agencies and regional organizations. In addition, in 2017, he was named the National Director of the Seawall Coalition, and since 2000 has served as the President of Honor Builders, two rapidly growing organizations focused on strategic engineering and coastal resilience. Paul retired from the U.S. Army in 2015. His culminating assignment, and how many of us here know him today, was as he commanded the Norfolk District of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, where he gained national recognition in sea level rise planning and port modernization. Colonel Olson is a registered professional engineer, and he holds a master's of science and civil and infrastructure engineering from George Mason University, a master's of arts degree in business management from Webster University, and a master's in strategic studies from the U.S. Army War College. Of note, he was named the 2014 Champion of the Port for Hampton Roads, the 2015 Government Engineer of the Year by the American Society of Civil Engineers, and the winner of the Pentagon's prestigious 2004 PACE Award for Innovation. Colonel Olson. Thanks. My mom wrote that introduction. She wanted to make sure everything was in there. My sisters don't believe anything in there is true. Um, well, welcome. I see a lot of luminaries in the audience, and that is enormously encouraging. So thank you all for attending. And uh, this is a very important topic indeed, one that I have been following for six years when I had my choice of about six engineering districts out there to command, I only had one I wanted to go to, and that was Norfolk because of the military and the environmental challenges. So it's a real honor that I can retire and continue to be part of the team, and a part of a great thing that we've all started. Before I get to the panel members, I just want to lay on a little context of why this is the place, why this place needs to be resilient because we often forget this. Today we're focusing on the military. Last night we saw a film that focused specifically on the Navy. These are just part of a larger thing that's going on in Hampton Roads, which is what Admiral Ann Phillips calls a center of national gravity. And what she means by that, and why, why I agree with that, is national power in its very simple definition is really defined by four things. It's a simple little acronym and there won't be a test on it. DIME, a strong nation needs diplomacy. And we have that with a NATO headquarters right here in Hampton Roads, which is also very vulnerable to sea level rise, as the French five-star General Mercier will tell you. We have information technology, that's the I in DIME which we have this with our growing cyber footprint and our expertise that we're seeing from our great universities throughout the Commonwealth. But the last two trump them all. M, military. We have the largest Navy base in the world. We have two other four-star commands in the Army and the Air Force present. So when you think about military, we own military at Hampton Roads. And the other one is just as important as the M in dime, and that's the E, which is a strong nation needs a strong economy. We have been seeing that our economy expand significantly since the widening of the Panama Canal, and now almost right kit the weekly visit or more so of ships that are taking advantage of the Panama Canal and calling on quite possibly the only port on the East Coast that can take them because our channels are deep, they're wide, they're safe, and Colonel Kelly's gonna take them deeper, wider, and safer, right? So, so they keep coming here, and this is all very important because if they don't come to Campton Roads, they'll go to another port in another nation, and that's just not acceptable. So that's some context for you. However, there are threats. There are threats to diplomacy. There are threats from, to information technology through cyber. There's clear threats to our military and there's threats to this economic engine that I've just laid out for you. And the, one of the major threats is in slow motion. And that's of our rising seas and our settling land. 
So we know the seas are rising and we know why they're rising because polar ice caps are melting. But that's only about half the problem. The other half comes from us sinking. We're taking too much groundwater out of our aquifer and as a sponge dries up in the sun, the same phenomenon is happening. We're sinking. Also, back in my home state, there was this big glacier before my time. It melted and the land's rebounding. So much as you pull the center of a tablecloth, the edges come on in, that's happening to us too. And to add to that, the Gulf Stream, as it slows down, gets wider, the big whirlpool of the Gulf Stream, and now it's pushing more water up against Virginia than anywhere else on the East Coast. That's the triple whammy. So some things we can't do anything about. We really can't do too much about the sea rising. We can do our fair share, but we can't do much about it. We can't do much to speed up the Gulf Stream. Right, Dr. Luckenbach? We can't very much stop the land from rebounding in the center of our country, but what we can do is we can slow down the subsidence. So I ask you all to get smart on HRSD's SWIFT program. Not the topic of this discussion, but it's something we can do. Today's panel is going to freshen up the debate. We've got some new faces at the panel. I think you all are getting tired of some of us old saws talking too much. So we've got some new faces coming to the panel. I'd like to give each one a long introduction, but I won't because time's of the limited. But I'm going to go out one at a time. The first one is my dear friend, Shanna Udvardi. Shanna and I worked three years ago when she first reached out that she, from the Union of Concerned Scientists, was going to do a study specifically noted the threat of sea level rise to our military bases. Her study illuminates the threat, and overall it's a great organization that I have been following since, I was a sec so since I've been a second lieutenant. Shanna, her, her uh, bio is is long and experienced. In the military, we would say, Shana, you've got plenty of boots on the ground time, whether it's Southeast Asia or other places. And she's got her own battle scar. I won't go into details because I don't know it, but apparently you were bit by an ant in Cambodia or Laos. And that has clearly given you the superpowers to illuminate the threat to our military bases. Ladies and gentlemen, Shana, you've already. It's wonderful to be here. Um, as was noted, I'm with the Union of Concerned Scientists. We're a nonprofit, non-governmental environmental organization. We've been around for over 40 years, and we've got about 500,000 members who provide us with most of our funding, about 70% of the funding. So the Union of Concerned Scientists um, did some analysis on the frequency and extent of coastal flooding due to climate-driven sea level rise. We looked at 18 military installations along the east and Gulf Coast, as you can see here on the map. Uh, and we examined their changing exposure to coastal flooding in 2050, 2070, and 2100. We chose these sites uh, based on some input from um, a steering committee and um, to get good representation of coastal bases. Um, and in terms of we wanted to um, capture the uh, different sizes, we also wanted different purposes, locations, as well as military branches. And we did this study to really understand sea level rise and storm surge and how it will affect the military, given its strong presence on the coast, its tight interconnectedness to the community that we heard about last night, um, and then also due to the important role the military plays to national security. So for our analysis, we looked at two different scenario, sea level rise scenarios based on the national climate assessment, looked at the intermediate and the high scenarios. And the high scenario takes into account the accelerating rate of ice melt, of sheet ice melt, and is more likely to be the case today and is a good indicator for those folks who um, have a low tolerance of risk like the military. And again, looking at 2050, 2070, and 2100. So in the Hampton Roads area, I think you all know very well what um, we're in store for now into 2100, but just wanted to run through it a little bit. Um, as you may know, the um, Hampton Roads area has a higher level of projected sea level rise compared to the global average. 
So in 2050, under the intermediate scenario, this looks like just under one and a half feet. Um, and into 2100, this goes as high as just under seven feet compared to about uh, six and a half feet um, under the um, global average. So I wanted to just quickly run through this. This is why we need the lights down a little bit. Um, so just walking you through um, this analysis, we wanted to look at land loss due to uh, tidal flooding. And so um, if you, uh, shown here on the left is the uh, different bases on, under the intermediate scenario, and on the right is under the high scenario. And what we're looking at is the different colors represent the time steps, 2050, 2070, and 2100. So what we found is that all of the 18 installations that we studied um, in, have increased coastal flooding risks as sea level rises, and some face significant land loss. Included here are 13 of the 18 installations, all of which are projected to experience 20% or greater of land loss at some point this century. So even with a mid-range sea level rise scenario, we found that um, nearly half of the 18 installations we studied have increased flooding from 10 times today to about 270 uh, or more times by 2050. And then if you look on the right, we find that about a quarter or more of their land loss um, to see will be the end of the century. And then again on the right, so looking at four, uh, we found that four bases will have land loss of about a fifth or more by 2050. And these include Naval Air Station Key West in Florida, which you, probably isn't a surprise, and Hampton Roads, this includes Joint uh, base Langley Eustis, as well as Naval Air Station Oceana Dam Neck. And then in South Carolina, it includes the Marine Corps Recruit Depot, uh, Paris Island. So we consider these estimates to be conservative because what we're considering land loss is um, areas that are flooded daily. And the military and other folks that are planning for critical infrastructure may consider um, uh, the la uh, the, it to be a lot less than that frequency. So we just wanted to run through a few of the installations that we looked at in Hampton Roads. Here on the right, you can see um, Naval Air Station Oceana Damnick. And um, what we found is that um, most of the flooding happens in the wetland areas, no surprise there. Um, but uh, in 2050, we'll see flooding um, about 100 times per year under the intermediate scenario, and that 95% of the area will be underwater by 25, uh, 2100. So on the left, we can see the land loss that we've projected under the intermediate and high scenario. And we find that there's extensive land loss under these different time steps, but particularly under the high scenario in 2100, um, which could be up to um, as much as 75%. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, we also looked at um, storm surge. And what we found is that, um, like many of the installations, but particularly Damnick, is highly vulnerable to storm surge. And it increases the extent and depth of the flooding. And we found that by 2100, a Cat 1 storm under either scenario exposes the installation to at least 95% of the station to storm surge flooding. Moving on to um, Langley Air Force Base, we actually looked at both uh, the joint uh, uh, Langley and Eustis. Uh, and so um, on the right, you can see that the tidal flooding, similar to the previous base, is really focused along the wetland area. We found that under the, um, end of the, by the end of the century, under the in intermediate scenario, high tides would roughly um, expose 10% of the station to flooding. And this increases dramatic, dramatically under the high scenario at the end of the century would be about 60% um, of the base. And I'm just going to keep running through this um, a little bit. Naval Air Station Norfolk has, is a little bit less severe as far as the tidal flooding now into the end of the century. Um, but there is a big story about storm surge. And um, what we found under the intermediate scenario, a Cat 1 storm would um, I'm going to actually going to run to this next slide so you can see what I'm talking about. So this is a chart under the intermediate and high scenario of storm surge. So under the intermediate scenario, we found that it'll increase the amount of exposure um, in 2070 about uh, three times, and then in 2100 up to about 78% of 
the installation. And under either scenario, by the end of the century, um, the whole base will be um, exposed to storm surge. So just quickly moving on to solutions, we heard about some great solutions that Dr. Smith mentioned earlier. I think all everybody in this room really understands what those are. We can protect, we can accommodate, and we can also retreat. When I got to visit Hampton Roads and speak to many of you, um, we saw some great work that was being done, like nature-based solutions. Um, this dune here on the left, where we saw at uh, Dam Neck, as well as dealing with inland flooding and, um, and, and tidal flooding with uh, pumps, and um, also mapping through um, the great work that NASA Langley did, and then this green and gray um, um, approach. So there's a lot to do that we can do on the local level, and the military is taking that on in a, in a pretty serious way. What we really need is um, Congress to fund the federal agencies that we really depend on and that we depended on for this research to be able to have the data to um, share with you today. And that means federal agencies like NASA who provide the satellites and like NOAA who helped provide the tide gauge data that we relied on and um, EPA as well. One of the things we are happy to be working on in um, coalition with a lot of other folks is making sure that DOD has the ability to um, work on climate change and understand the impacts of climate change on the military installations. So we're happy to see that the climate change um, amendment by, Dr. Lang uh, by um, Congressman Langley made it through um, and had a, a bipartisan uh, um, vote um, and we're hoping, hoping to see that go through conference successfully. And my last slide is just to give you a quick introduction to our latest research we put out this summer. Really wanted to look at uh, tidal flooding and chronic inundation, um, which is basically thinking about how frequent and what extent of flooding needs to happen that it's very disruptive. I think you all know this here in Hampton Roads area. We landed on a definition of 10% uh, of the non-usable land area, non-wetland, non-levied, and 26 times per year based on some ground truthing. So quickly, you can go to our website. Um, it's called When Rising Seas Hit Home. We have an interactive map, so you can look at anywhere in the, in the 48 contiguous states and see what this looks like now into 2100 under different climate scenarios. Um, and as well as looking at social vulnerability. And just to quickly highlight, we also looked at, and, and wrapping up on the solutions, we also looked at what would it look like, how many communities would be saved from what we're calling chronic inundation if we do adhere to the Paris Accord. And what we found is that hundreds of communities could be saved. Um, and, and, and the yellow area here is, a, is a, sorry for the map, but it's um, a blow up of the Hampton Roads area. And you can see in yellow the um, number of communities that could be saved if we um, keep warming to about uh, 1.8 degrees Celsius. So with that, I'd like to pass it on to uh, the next speaker. Thanks, Shauna. That's some good stuff. I think I need to go to uh, Laos and get bit by one of those intellectual ants. Um, and thank you for saving me a couple color cartridges by this report. These are good reads, I highly recommend them. Our next speaker is a, uh, a former co-commander with me, my good friend uh, George Bonner. He uh, used to command the Coast Guard Shore Infrastructure Logistics Center here in Hampton Roads, and now he's the executive officer to the Admiral who covers all coastal infrastructure and uh, logistics for the United States Coast Guard. So he's got a real bird's eye view on what's, what's going on. Um, he's in it to win it, and I know that for a fact because he's got a beautiful house in Manteo in the Outer Banks. So he's committed, just like I am, who I own a house in Pocosin, and you know that's pretty low too. And, um, and is also the uh, recipient uh, last year of the Hampton Roads Government Engineer of the Year uh, for ASCE. Ladies and gentlemen, my good friend, Captain George Bonner. Hey, good morning. Uh, it's great to be here and be part of this discussion on a topic that really interests me on a personal level and as a Coast Guard officer uh, and also in my profession as an engineer. Uh, like Paul mentioned, I grew up on the Outer Banks 
and I uh, got to see firsthand, uh, and I've lived on the water most of my life, um, the impacts of our rising waters and the challenges on our coast with as development has increased. And it's great to see my high school classmate Shanda here from Manio. Um, and as a Coast Guard officer, I've spent a good part of my career uh, responding to natural disasters and adapting our infrastructure. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those impacts and some of the things we're doing uh, to be more proactive in how we adapt our infrastructure. And then as a professional engineer, how are we adapting our practice as engineers uh, to the change in climate and uncertainty of sea level rise? Uh, for over two centuries, uh, the Coast Guard has protected uh, our nation's maritime interest. And our value to the nation is our commitment to protect those on the sea, the threats of the sea, and to protect the sea itself. And, uh, let me see, let's switch slides here. So to perform those missions, uh, the Coast Guard men and women uh, use a bunch of tools. We use cutters, boats, aircraft, and each one of those uh, platforms begins and ends that mission at a shore facility. So where are those facilities at? Uh, unlike DOD, we don't have a lot of large bases. We have a very dispersed uh, shore footprint with a lot of facilities. And you can see each one of these facilities uh, is in a, a very vulnerable area on our waterways and on our coast. Um, so we've been subjected to a lot of damages from that. And uh, even more so than DOD, we're also dependent on those communities for the resilience of the community, for schools, transportation, um, all the things that we rely on in the homes in the community. So I'm just going to go through some of the more recent examples that where we've had impacts from coastal storms and, the, and rising seas. Uh, these are some examples from uh, Hurricane Ike, and I think there may be some Katrina pictures in here as well. On the left, uh, that's some new housing we recently built in the Florida Keys um, following some damage. I think that was from Hurricane Katrina, where we elevated the house um, out of the floodplain, built a more resilient footprint. Uh, the middle picture in the top, uh, that's down in Galveston, Texas from Hurricane Ike, where we had flood damage and wind damage uh, from, that, from that storm. And at the bottom right, you can see where we adapted the facility, uh, built it out of the floodplain, put all the transformers on the facility out of the, tr out of the floodplain. And, um, and then to the top right, that's our sector command center in Houston. And uh, that was an example where we actually retreated that location away from the floodplain and put it in a, in a less vulnerable uh, location. And um, the good news is all these facilities with the recent storms this summer performed well and provided mission assurance uh, for the Coast Guard as we responded to the, the disasters this summer. So uh, like we talked about Superstorm Sandy, uh, wide range impacts for the Coast Guard all the way from the Mid-Atlantic way up into New England. Um, just a couple of examples. Uh, on the left, uh, that's Station New York um, on Staten Island, New York. Uh, got flood damage, uh, a lot of damage from the flooding. And in that location, once again, we retreated the station, put it up on higher ground um, to a more resilient location. Uh, the two other stations are there, Station Atlantic City and Station Sandy Hook, New Jersey. Uh, major flood damage. You can see the water line at Sandy Hook, how, how far it came up. And those examples, we didn't really have a, a place to retreat to, but we, we moved them out of the floodplain and made a more resilient footprint there. So and it's just not the major hurricanes and um, coastal storms. We also see them recurring uh, flooding at a lot of our older uh, facilities. Uh, this is a station up at Brant Point on the island of Nantucket. And uh, more and more we're seeing recurring flooding from just normal uh, wind events. And you can see in the middle the, the moorings completely covered uh, um, by the flooding. And then the, the, the far right, uh, the station being flooded uh, um, all on the first deck there. So it's been a busy uh, last uh, couple of months with all the storms uh, from uh, Harvey, Irma, uh, Jose, and Maria. And uh, the Coast Guard has been extremely busy. Uh, some of the pictures on uh, the top left, uh, that's uh, one of our pump boats uh, uh, with folk, families flooded uh, in Hurricane uh, Harvey down in the uh, Houston area. And um, our helos were very busy. Uh, the bottom left, that's Hurricane Maria where we're repairing uh, some wind damage to one of our facilities there in San Juan. You can see the comfort in the background there and some of the Coast Guard cutters that were delivering humanitarian support to the people of Puerto Rico. And we're still extremely busy there. So what are we doing? Uh, there's two uh, strategic documents the Coast Guard has, the Coast Guard Arctic Strategy and the Coast Guard Western Hemisphere Strategy uh, that acknowledge uh, climate change and they uh, present uh, solutions on how the Coast Guard is going to deal with it uh, in three ways, operational preparedness, uh, building resilience in our infrastructure, and collaborating with our partners, which is like what we're doing here today. 
And uh, on the infrastructure side, a couple years ago, we implemented the shore infrastructure vulnerability assessment to take a look across the whole enterprise. And so instead of responding to these events, how can we better understand our vulnerability to all natural hazards, whether that's tsunamis and sea level rise? Um, so we, that, that's ongoing and hopefully can make some better strategic decisions about what our footprint's gonna look like. And uh, here recently, uh, this summer, with all the impacts to the, within the Department of Homeland Security, we've implemented a DHS reconstitution team. So with all our partners within FEMA, whether that's Coast, uh, the Border Protection Team or FEMA and the Coast Guard, we're working together to make sure, make sure we're providing the best value uh, to the public. And then, uh, like we said, as an engineer, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty with sea level rise. What models do we use? And we've had really good information from the Corps of Engineers, our partners at NOAA, FEMA, the DHS Centers for Excellence at UNC Chapel Hill. They have a Coastal Center for Resilience. Uh, but how, there's so much uncertainty. So uh, like we talked about earlier, we continue to look to promote low regret solutions uh, that can respond uh, to a, a range of, uh, of sea level rise. So that's what we're trying to promote. And so the Coast Guard can remain simple products moving forward. So thank you. So for our IT expert, Colonel Rogie is the next presentation. And while that's being pulled up, um, thank you, thank you. As you see, the, the first panelist, Shauna, kind of scared the pants off of us. <laughs> and then George comes in like a true Coast Guardian, saves the day, at least for the Coast Guard. Uh, I think it's important to point out the Coast Guard's really busy. I was talking to Admiral Austin uh, last week. 2,100 search and rescue missions so far this year just for the Mid-Atlantic region. So for you boaters out there, let's, let's kind of give them a break because clearly they're busy enough. Um, so we, we, we saw the threat again and we're not going to go back to the threat. We're seeing solutions from the Coast Guard. This afternoon, we're gonna be blessed by seeing uh, solutions out of the Corps of Engineers and other agencies, so we're getting into the solution side. But you don't get to solutions without deep thought. Uh, our third panelist is a, a good colleague of mine, a former retired Corps of Engineer officer. And you know he's the type of guy, when I was in the engineer uh, advanced course, I was usually hovering around the bottom of the class and, and you know, here's a guy who's just slaying it at the top of the class. Uh, he's since retired from the military and is a well-known advisor to national security uh, professionals uh, in, in the Washington, D.C. area. And no better way to start evolving the conversation away from threat towards solution than getting your insights. Colonel Rogi, Paul. You know, thanks, Paul. I'd like to thank the Center for uh, inviting me here today and for Paul for organizing this panel. Um, I have some ties to this community. About eight or nine years ago, and I really started to look at this resilience thing, actually lived here in Williamsburg, worked at Fort Monroe, was kind of impressed by little lines you saw on the steps that said, well, Hurricane Irene, Hurricane whatever, that the waters rose to this level. And so I really uh, started uh, looking around, talking to people, and realized that there's a lot of of conversation about resilience in this area. And I found that this is one place that you can find uh, people not only interested, but cross-talking among government, among industry, utilities, academia. And so it's an area where you can actually generate some interest in this resilience conversation more so and, and more knowing conversation than you can in some other places. Um, by the way, we have some other more favorable ties to the area. My wife actually rang the bell in this courtyard a few years ago when she received her doctorate. So uh, we, we don't just live in Montana and think, hey, there are these other places around. This is one place that actually means something to us. So I'm really glad to be here today. What I'd like to talk about is sort of an emergence in, uh, of resilience and how it causes us to think differently. So after I left here, I went to a place called DARPA up in the DC area and then ultimately went to the Army staff and had a chance to live and work in the Pentagon for a while. And around the 2010-2011 time frame, one of the common sort of arguments out there among military leaders and others was that, you know, we need to be able to island our military bases because we've got these grid threats to electromagnetic pulse, to cyber threat, to weather events. And so our bases need to be able to continue to operate, have energy when the lights go out everywhere else. So I... Uh, 
happily, I had the chance to be there in the Pentagon during that time, and I was able to get together with some senior leaders, assistant secretaries, deputies, and talk to them about maybe the folly of that way of thinking because uh, military bases don't necessarily operate as islands. So as we started down the conversation, inevitably people ask a number of questions, like what is resilience and what am I supposed to be resilient to and what's it gonna cost and, and how am I gonna sell it to the, uh, uh, the budget folks? And so those questions are uh, logical questions, but they also sort of uh, expose maybe a, a less than full understanding of what resilience really means anyway uh, on their own parts, but also uh, the need for uh, some evolution in our processes and our thinking uh, institutionally. And so uh, what I really want to touch on today is how do we change that way of thinking and where are we going with that evolution uh, within DOD and maybe elsewhere. So this is what people tend to think about when you say, hey, we need to be more resilient on our bases. And energy resilience has been one of the early arguments. We did some assessments across military installations about two years ago, uh, to see you know, how resilient are we from an energy standpoint. Well, uh, what we've done in the past is we've, we've established very uh, deeply this notion of critical infrastructure. So given our scarcity mentality that we've developed over the last number of years, we know that you can't fix everything, you can't be prepared for everything, there's only so many resources. So what we'll do is we'll identify those things that are the most critical to our mission, to our continued operations, and we'll do something that somehow bolsters their capability. So this is a backup generator behind a critical building. If the power goes out, at least the command center will continue to operate. So that's really great, um, except that really when the power goes out, you can't just have that command center continuing to operate. You need other things. You need transportation. Your cell phone doesn't work if the communication system's down. Law enforcement's important, especially when things are going bad. And so all these different uh, aspects of the community need to continue to operate and they need to be not degraded too much or things start to unravel. And that, that command center isn't gonna do you quite so much good. So that takes us back then to the question of what is this resilience idea? Is resilience different from protecting those critical functions? Is there a different way that we can think about it? So first of all, um, we organized some research groups those, those years ago uh, because we recognized that resilience might become popular and it would be good to have some grounded definitions, metrics, and bodies of knowledge about resilience to say, well, what is that really when people try to sell their backup generator as your resilience means? So first of all, this is a really simple way to think about resilience. It's your ability to survive and thrive in the, fa in the face of change. So change and uncertainty has been uh, really prominent in our military doctrine over the last decade or so, but we haven't had good approaches to address that. So resilience is actually very consistent with our, our vision of the operational world. So now we're thinking about not how can I design for all these things that I figured out and used all these techniques to predict the storms and the cyber attacks and so forth, rather recognize that with humility that change and uncertainty are out there and we don't know everything. And so we need to have ways systemically to be able to respond to that. So resilience then is our, our capacity to, to weather this change, not our resistance to one specific thing. So it doesn't mean that we shouldn't plan for things that we can anticipate, sea levels rising, weather's changing, we have more drought out in Montana where I live. And so those are certainly things that we need to be specifically prepared for, but we also need to recognize that there are things that we don't anticipate, we don't know about, and so we need the systemic capability to withstand change. Well, what does that mean? Uh, what, one analogy that we can use to think about resilience uh, versus this protection strategy is healthcare, which has undergone a similar uh, negative sort of trend in that last century. Uh, we've moved more toward uh, uh, injury and disease-based uh, medicine. And so we look for ways to find and pre prevent and treat specific illnesses. Well, we should still uh, do that. We should understand cancer, figure out how to treat cancer, how to treat symptoms and so forth. But what we need to do is get back toward 
uh, a mode where we're thinking about health. And so we see more and more conversation today about preventative medicine, about improving health, about nutrition. And what happens when you do that? Uh, you end up having stronger immune systems, you have better circulatory systems, uh, and by the way, your body is better able to adapt if you have some sort of an injury, and it can grow the nerves and the uh, capillaries and so forth uh, to adapt after you've had that injury. So that health sort of view uh, can be a healthy way to think about resilience as opposed to simple protection that we've thought about in the past. So the military doesn't move quickly, but uh, today I, I'm glad to say that each of the services and DOD have recognized within their strategies and their directives this notion of resilience. And we have a ways to go in terms of changing the systems, in terms of really embracing resilience principles, um, but I'll just talk about the Army briefly uh, because it has uh, recognized resilience in a couple ways. Uh, on the one hand, uh, we started to talk about resilience in response to a high suicide rate. So we've built a soldier and family resilience program. Uh, we've got a director, we've got a whole program that tries to improve the ability of our soldiers and families to respond to change and uncertainties. Similarly, in the energy domain, we have a new energy uh, and sustainability strategy that talks about resilience. And so you can see on the left sort of the tenets of that new strategy. It includes building resilience, uh, adaptation, innovation. All of those things sort of speak to uh, being prepared and responding to change. Uh, and then uh, some of that is being reflected in the projects. So this particular vignette, the slide that shows a project at Schofield Barracks, represents not just a backup power project, but the Army in this case has afforded some land available to local utility to build a, a power plant above the tsunami flooding line. Uh, that power plant can burn multiple fuels, including biomass, and so it has some flexibility. They're adapting to changing conditions. There's collaboration. By the way, the Army will have priority in the power that's produced in the event of some kind of a grid outage, uh, regardless of what kind of an emergency it is. So we're seeing uh, both the recognition and the response to this different idea about resilience as a way of thinking as a institutional capacity versus just the sort of countering specific threats that we think we see out there. So what do we do in the future? First of all, we need to recognize that resilience is a community effort, and I think that's something that's well embraced here in the Tidewater area. I've had plenty of conversations with people in all sectors, often in the same room together, which is really hard to do. Um, military, uh, in the beginning, uh, was looked at as sort of the savior. People always look to the military to lead things. Uh, we think that they're supposed to do something for us in terms of resilience. Certainly they bring something to the table. They're out there helping to rescue people. Uh, they're out there you know, helping in the event of an emergency. They have money to invest in assuring mission, reinforcing power capabilities. Um, so they bring something to the table, but they're not necessarily in charge. So to make progress, we need to, one, recognize that collaboration uh, not only is important, but in order to recognize all the values that are out there and sometimes to, to garner enough resources for some kind of a project or some kind of an initiative, uh, it takes recognizing the value that's brought to the, the community, to the military, to the local governments, to the utility collectively to make the case for some kind of action. Uh, it also requires community participation. People need to understand what does this mean for them because they're the ones ultimately who vote for, who uh, follow up for, who actually implement uh, resilience. When the hurricane comes, guess who's out there rescuing the neighbors? It's those people in the community. And then finally, leadership uh, is something that isn't just from the top. It's not just we have some president or, or governor or county commissioner or somebody who takes leadership, but it's each of us. And so as family members, parents, uh, kids, friends, neighbors, uh, we each need to display leadership in this resilience domain because resilience is both uh, a bottoms-up grassroots thing and a top-down institutional collaborative thing. And so that's something I think to keep in mind. Um, I'm optimistic about uh, the Tidewater area not only uh, being able to uh, bounce back, to be resilient, to be able to weather uh, whatever's coming, but actually to take uh, a leadership role 
and set models and examples for people in other places. And so I'm looking forward to a lot of that evolution in the future. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Paul, and I uh, appreciate having your experience up there in D.C. and in the Pentagon. In fact, at the reception last night, I was talking to General Barnes, and we were comparing how many tours we had in the Pentagon. He had about five, I had about three, and he said, you know, Colonel, you know how many sides the Pentagon has? And I said, okay, I got a bite on this one. He goes, I go five? And he said, no two sides, inside and outside, and we're on the right sides. But thank you for serving on the inside. We need those people on the inside in DC, and that's really part of us moving forward, and why having this, this conference at the Coastal Policy Clinic is so important, because all this stuff ultimately has to drive policy, which drives funding, and we need people up in near our nation cap nation's capital who will do that for us and will do that uh, smartly. Our next panelist is an example of what we have done in Hampton Roads to homegrown, home grow our own. My uh, friend and colleague, uh, Jen Armstrong, uh, we first met in the Corps of Engineers where we served together. She did a developmental assignment as my strategist to talk about sea level rise and everything else and moving forward, yet she has the experience of actually having it done. Next time you go down to the Sandbridge Beach, the new beach, or Willoughby Spit, and you see those new beautiful buffer beaches, thank Jen, those were her, her uh, projects. She then did a tour up into the Corps of Engineers at the headquarters and learned how it's done now, uh, how it's done there. But currently, I think we're really, we're really blessed to have her speak to us and have a few words because she serves as a professional staffer for the Senate Subcommittee on Water and sorry, energy and water. So she is where the action happens. This is critical. We need to form more of people like Jen to get up there and Paul to affect policy for the future of Hampton Roads. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, her. And also, if you enjoy oyster oysters in uh, Hampton Roads, she was also the oyster project manager who brought them back to our area. So Jen Armstrong. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor. And uh, as a native of the Tidewater area, uh, this uh, hits me both personally, personally and professionally. When we talk about what Congress is doing for coastal resiliency, sea level rise, or any topic really, it's an important distinction to make between authorization and appropriation. Uh, it's a common misconception that if a federal agency is authorized to undertake a certain action, that they can immediately get out there and, and start doing it. But there's a second step to that, and that's getting the funding to do so, and that's where I come in. I work for the Energy and Water Development Appropriations Subcommittee. We fund the Department of Energy, the Corps of Engineers, Bureau of Reclamation, and other independent agencies like the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The Corps is really unique in that its civil works mission, which includes the navigation, the flood control, the flood risk management, isn't funded in defense appropriations like most uh, DOD entities. Instead, it's under energy and water. And there's a really interesting history on how that came to be. Um, back in late last century, uh, nuclear was very controversial. And in effort to find a way to get a better chance of those bills getting passed, they combined it with a very popular agency, which is the Corps of Engineers. In fact, in FY18, 82 senators made specific uh, appropriations requests uh, to our bill, and that's pretty substantial when it comes to just showing the popularity of the Corps, and that's because there isn't one state out there that isn't touched in one way or another by what the Corps does. The biggest challenge that I face as an appropriator is the earmark ban. And the earmark ban had uh, the good intention of trying to eliminate pork barrel spending. But for the Corps of Engineers, which is a project-funded organization, and those projects are justified based on the national economic benefits that they provide. In other words, even though that project may take place in one state or one region, uh, they have national significance to the economy. What the earmark ban really essentially did was it disrupted the balance of powers by shifting the power of the purse from the legislative branch over to the executive branch. And this is significant because the administration's priorities do not always align with congressional priorities. Uh, there are 30 coastal states in the U.S., 
So that's 60% of the senators that have a very vested interest in making sure that we are addressing uh, the risk and mitigate the, uh, the risks of sea level rise. So there are a couple of tools that we have uh, that we're able to use, and one of those is that we're able to put any additional funding that we are given in our authority to funding pots. And those funding pots are targeted towards certain types of activities like navigation or shore protection. In fact, in FY17, we were able to provide an additional two and a half million for shore protection feasibility studies, an additional 50 million for shore protection uh, construction projects, and we're able to increase some of the programmatic line items uh, like the coastal ocean data system, which provides long-term wave information and storm event data uh, to support sustainable uh, coastal projects in a changing climate. We're also able to use uh, legislative language to provide direction or intent uh, with respect to how that funding should be used uh, by the agencies. Uh, we did that in FY17 as well by encouraging the Corps to fund coastal resilience projects uh, under the CAP authority when they were considering funding for CAP, um, the Continuing Authorities project, uh, Program. Uh, those CAP projects are a useful tool for the Corps to undertake small, localized projects without having to go through the lengthy study and the lengthy authorization project. They're typical of your much larger uh, core projects. Another challenge uh, that we face is working under a continuing resolution. Uh, continuing resolutions uh, are temporary funding measures um, that are in place to fund the government and prevent a shutdown uh, until a fully funded uh, fiscal year budget can, or, uh, resolution can be passed. Um, and the challenge there is that it's the administration's policy not to fund projects in the CR that were not in the president's budget. So you can see that for storm protection projects, uh, shore protection projects, particularly those that have a renourishment component, like as uh, Paul mentioned, the Sandbridge project or the Virginia Beach project, those do not get funded unless a fully funded bill is passed or enacted. Um, and currently right now in FY18, we're working under a continuing resolution that expires on December 8th. Um, you know, it is our goal and intent to get something that fully funds uh, the, our agencies through the remainder of the fiscal year. Um, there are a lot of challenges, of course, political uh, environments that kind of influence uh, how we can go about doing that. Um, but, that, but that's our goal, and if we're given additional budget authority, um, then we will, our intent is to continue to increase funding for the core for these critical uh, resilience projects. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jen. Uh, the, the, the point of my panel was to endeavor to introduce some new fresh faces to the Hampton Road sea level rise argument that are focused on national level solutions. Because this is not a local problem, it's not a regional problem, it's not a core problem, it's not a Navy problem, this is a national problem. So I hope uh, the panel has presented that. Um, there will be other fresh faces also that you'll meet. I invite everybody to the reception after the conference where you'll see some young faces with some young tools catered more to the millennium and the generation xers that are getting a lot of, of uh, traction so that's uh, hosted by sealevelrise.org i have one question i'm dying to ask as moderator prerogative because i believe it's important and it goes to jen and that is um do you think congress will give our nation an emergency supplemental as they did after sandy to help americans and the, uh, that have been affected by the recent hurricanes because I haven't heard anything. Uh, so there were, there were currently we, uh, Congress is looking at the second supplemental. Um, and as, 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 I, as I understand right now, that that is not going to include any core funding. However, I think there is the intent uh, through a third supplemental in the future to provide that. One of the, uh, one of the things that really has to be discussed when you're talking about a bill like was done for Katrina or Sandy is that they include both an emergency funding, which are, goes towards the repair of damages that resulted from that storm, 
And then you have the resiliency component, which is constructing projects that could have prevented or could prevent future uh, flooding or damage that would result from uh, similar events in the future. And that resiliency funding is not an emergency designated funding. So the Budget Control Act of 2011 changed how that money is designated as emergency. So anything that's not emergency funding, which this resiliency funding would not be, uh, would count against the budget caps for energy and water development. So that six billion um, authority, budget cap authority that we're given, anything that would go towards resiliency projects in a supplemental would count against that, which means that that money is being taken away from other priorities in the country. And that, of course, presents a challenge when we're trying to uh, determine how that money will be spent. Anyone else have any questions for our panelists? Hi. <clears throat> good, good morning. I'd just like to I'd listen, and there was great stuff. Um, we talked about water resources development bills, and uh, I wanted to point out that Virginia's congressional delegation, uh, House and Senate, have not a single member on either authorization or appropriation subcommittees that developed the water resources development bill. Not one. Uh, the other is that you didn't make any mention of what the Commonwealth of Virginia is doing as a state to help with this and that there's a reason for that because it's nothing. Uh, they, don't, they do not serve as a, as a non-federal sponsor for the Corps of Engineers um, civil works projects by policy. And uh, Senator Wagner and Delegate Mayers are going to have a bill in front of the, of the House and Senate this year. Uh, that will change that, that will make the Commonwealth of Virginia the active uh, non-federal sponsor, which will greatly ease the military's current requirement to deal with every single locality uh, in what they do. So those are two things for the, in, that address the military. And in, in, in Virginia, for example, we just showed the coastal bases. Uh, Fort Belvoir and Marine Corps Base Quantico have, have enormous, they're in floodplains right now. So uh, I just wanted you all to know that and when you, as you proceed with your work, uh, those are, and getting the Commonwealth involved and therefore getting our congressional delegation involved is, is a key step. Thank you, all, all noted. Um, I endeavored to keep the focus of my panel at that level, sir. Uh, and you're gonna be hearing the things that you desired little later in the day when they, when they speak as well but all your points are well noted and we're aware of it. Anyone else with questions for the panel? All right, well, let's give them a hand. That was great. Thank you very much.